coastal town of Jerison on the Black Sea. Cars, buses, even semi-trucks, no match for the massive waves as the storm surge flooded the highway. Wow. This actually was sent to me via Twitter. Uh-huh. And I was like, you guys, Look at that. what is, I don't, I don't even know what caused this. We need to look into yeah. this and see what happened to cause this because this is not normal. As you, this is, wow. This is tsunami style. Yeah. That is insane. going on with this as it pulls away from Japan. This typhoon did have a pretty significant impact. It's now at its 70 mile an hour sustained winds within the center of that typhoon. So still a strong storm, not a super typhoon though, and is expected to very quickly downgrade as it continues on that path off toward the east and back out into the Pacific.
快。ここなんかここらの下。どうするこのタイミングで。やばいなこれ。下がるもっと。あそこだあそこだあ行こうあ今まだ行こうみんなじゃあ行こうどうしましょう<笑>どうしましょう<笑>間に合わない間に合わない It's a word you don't hear too often around Arizona. Plague. Kind of distressing. It turns out some fleas in northern Arizona have tested positive for plague, and that has people on high alert. Kristen Keogh's been looking into it. She just returned from Flagstaff. She joins us live. And fleas can spread this to both humans and animals. And this can actually be deadly to people and pets. But if found early on, it is very easily treatable with antibiotics. That being said, though, residents of Coconino County should be aware of the symptoms and be looking out for fleas. Fleas with plague were discovered in prairie dog burrows northeast of Flagstaff in the Doney Park area. Dogs? don't show any signs or symptoms typically for plague, but they can bring the plague-infected fleas back to their owners. However, cats, when they're bitten by an infected flea, they become deathly ill. And if they don't get treatment right away, antibiotic treatment, they can die from it. Period, the time from the, the flea bites you to the time you start feeling signs and symptoms is one to seven days with an average about two to three days. The symptoms, sudden onset of fever, like 104 or higher. Then you're gonna have body itch. You're gonna feel really bad. You're gonna have chills. And so with these types of symptoms, you would definitely wanna to get to a doctor. She's a 10-year-old girl. She's from Rhode Island. She's one of four people that you mentioned who have died, who tested positive for enterovirus 68. Now, health officials are being very clear, saying it's not sure whether, in fact, the virus contributed to their deaths. All they know is that it was present in their bodies when they died. Now, the 10-year-old girl was short of breath. She was having trouble breathing, so her parents took her to the hospital basically to get her checked out, make sure everything was okay. Well, a state official says that once that child arrived at the hospital, in his words, quote, everything fell apart within 24 hours. Now, this child had two health issues. Not only did she have the enterovirus, but she also had a staph infection. This is a very rare combination, and the staph appears at this point to have been the main cause of death. But officials looking at this very closely. And, and hospitals are also worried about a polio-like form of the virus. Yeah, and this is really surprising to everybody. Colorado, Boston, Michigan, 
Doctors there have seen a handful of cases of this mysterious neurological illness that weakens the limbs, it causes a, a cranial nerve dysfunction, as well as abnormalities in spinal gray matter. Colorado had 10 cases uh, where children were hospitalized, Boston had four, Michigan, one child actually developed this partial paralysis after being hospitalized. And right now in Colorado, the children are undergoing physical therapy. Doctors there say it, it's really not clear what the long-term effects of this partial paralysis will ultimately be. And these enteroviruses, they're, I mean, they're pretty common. Could the numbers actually go higher? Yeah, they could, Anderson. And the reason the CDC is prioritizing its testing, specifically they're looking at children who have severe respiratory illnesses. They're the ones who are at greatest risk. The numbers are expected to grow because test results are not yet back on what they call cluster of people who have been hospitalized with respiratory illnesses. taking you inside an Ebola isolation unit in rural Africa. A worker carrying our camera. Going deeper, still more sick patients. Children. For Dr. Gobi Logan, desperate times call for desperate measures. While the world waits for a proven Ebola drug, he's experimenting with an HIV drug called lamivudine in order for everyone in the unit not to die. I think I need to try this medication. This is as close as I can get to this Ebola isolation unit. And I want to introduce you to four young women, Elizabeth, Susan, Fatu, and Masa. They came here with Ebola, but they were given the HIV drug, and now they're doing well. They're able to walk around, and they'll be discharged soon. In a CBS 46 exclusive, we want to know why the U.S. government is issuing guidelines to local funeral homes on how to handle the remains of Ebola patients. So here's the question. Does the U.S. expect Ebola to turn into a serious health threat here? CBS 46's Jocelyn Connell joins us now live from Decatur. So, Jocelyn, what would you find out? The best we can do as a society is to do our best to prepare for it. That's what we've done. Lisa English heads up the Georgia Funeral Directors Association. Our communication. She's talking about this information from the CDC distributed to the state's 2,000 funeral directors. It says Ebola can be transmitted in post-mortem care. The recommendations to funeral workers are chilling. They include wearing personal protective equipment such as surgical scrub suits and avoiding autopsies and embalming. How am I gonna Case of Ebola now here in the United States. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention confirming the first American case of the deadly virus now being di uh, diagnosed at a hospital in Dallas. He traveled here from Liberia. No, no symptoms shown until nine days after he arrived. Went to the doctor once, came back, went back again. The director of the CDC trying to make sure everybody remains calm. I have no doubt that we will control this importation or this case of Ebola so that it does not spread widely in this country. It is certainly possible that someone who had contact with this individual, a family member or other individual, could develop Ebola in the coming weeks. But there is no doubt in my mind that we will stop it here. We already know of a handful of people, family members, several community members. We'll be looking at the hospital at every interaction there, uh, any transports to the hospital. All of those are situations that we have a nine-person team on the ground in Dallas now helping local and state health department to identify and monitor. As you can imagine, it, it's going to be a very painstaking process to try to get in touch with everybody that this guy potentially came in contact with. Maybe as many as 18 people, including ambulance attendants, who drove him to the hospital on the 28th. He came in actually in the 26th, went home, and then was so sick by the 28th that he had to come in an ambulance and, of course, all the medical workers at the Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital who came in contact with him. The plain truth, we can't make the risk zero until the outbreak is controlled in West Africa. 
What we can do is minimize that risk, as is being done now in Dallas, by working to ensure that there are no more individuals exposed. Last night, we placed orders uh, on a family. There's nothing more important than keeping you safe. It was clear to me, um, a Democrat, and uh, Governor Perry, a Republican, and everyone who looked at that information, that the action, and, uh, and the CDC today, after we laid it out for them, that the actions that we took, while unusual, were appropriate. Well, Texas health officials there talking about an order they placed on Thomas Duncan and his family, four members there, legal, legally requiring them to stay indoors and not have any visitors until October 19th when the virus is said to finish its incubation period. This as the Department of Health there in Te uh, Texas expanded the number of people who had contact with Duncan to 100. stabbed several times then that Nolan severed her head and at that point Lewis claims that Nolan met 43 year old Tracy Johnson began attacking her with the same knife and officials say that at that point Mark Vaughn Oklahoma County Reserve deputy and a former CEO of the business shot him as he was actively stabbing Johnson and Sergeant Lewis went on to add that uh, that he's obviously a hero in this uh, situation referring to Vaughn um, obviously America's now had you know, it's, I would describe it as its first ISIS-style beheading right here in the homeland. The 30-year-old who um, was uh, in jail back in 2011 on drug-related charges and assaulting a police officer. 
um, spent seven months behind bars. In 2006, he was uh, on probation for drug-related charges and um, has obviously made the conversion to Islam um, from all accounts and is uh, devoted to that faith. Um, beyond that, uh, the guy is still a bit of a mystery other than the fact that he's obviously extremely violent. Um, now, I don't know if we can connect the dots here, and the dots are that there was a call by the group ISIS issued earlier this week that lone wolf sympathizers in the U.S. should start attacking Americans on their home turf. And this, you know, obviously this guy is a recent convert to Islam. He tried to convert other workers. Have you been able to confirm that? Uh, again, from the police reports this morning, Sergeant Lewis's briefing, um, there were workers that said he had attempted to convert some of his co-workers to Islam. Sure. This is a Fox News alert. 911 calls now being released as the FBI investigates a shocking murder in the heartland. Police in Oklahoma say a man beheaded a woman at a food plant and stabbed another woman. Co-workers tell police the suspect, 30-year-old Alton Nolan, had been trying to convert them to Islam. Tonight, we have new details from a warning put out by the U.S. Army Threat Center. It went to American military families across the U.S. and around the world, and it suggested that they take specific steps to stay safe from the terror army known as ISIS. Our chief intelligence correspondent, Catherine Herridge, is live in Washington tonight with the details. Catherine? Well, thank you, Megan. We've had a chance to go through this advisory from the Army's Threat Integration Center that issues early warnings for criminal and terrorist threats to Army commands worldwide. And the advisory warns military personnel and their families to be vigilant after the Islamic State, also known as ISIS or ISIL, called on its supporters to target their homes. It reads in part, ISIL has called on lone offenders in the U.S. to use the yellow pages, social media sites like Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to find the addresses of service members, show up their homes and slaughter them. Here we go again. Islamic militants have published a video that is said to depict the murder of a uh, British convoy volunteer, Alan Henning, uh, the days after warning that he would be the next to be beheaded. He is the fourth such a Western hostage to have been beheaded by the group uh, ISIS, ISIL, depending on your won't. Uh, again, this is uh, being reported now in a number of publications, including the British Guardian and others, but that uh, Henning has indeed been beheaded.
County High School is at the center of a religious and political controversy. And it's all because of a donated monument at the school that has Bible verses on it. Yeah, some groups outside of Georgia say it violates the law, but Fox 5 spoke to several Madison County residents, and they say they're just fine with it. Fox 5's Patty Pan has a story. It sits seven feet tall and weighs an estimated two tons. This granite monument that sits outside the Madison County High School Fieldhouse has come to represent Red Raider pride. When I first saw it, I loved it. I thought it was amazing. I thought it was nice that there were still people with good values and good morals, you know, out there that were supporting our team. But now this monument has become the center of a political firestorm. Alongside the logos, it displays two prominent New Testament biblical passages. Since it was put up in late August, members of the Red Raiders football team have grown accustomed to touching the monument as they head out to the field. But according to two organizations, the problem is the use of the Christian references on the monument. The American Humanist Association and the Freedom From Religion Foundation both argue it violates the law. The problem is that it clearly endorses the Christian religion. It quotes from the Christian Bible. And as a public school, as a public school monument, that is constitutionally prohibited. Uh, so it's a clear violation of the separation of state and church. A university taking a rather provocative approach to combating sexual assault by holding a week of seminars, teaching students how to have safer and better sex. It may sound like a good idea, but what do you think? Here's the flyer for the University of New Mexico's so-called Sex Week. One of the seminars is called Negotiating Successful Threesomes. Yes, I just said that on television. And that's one of the tamer titles that we can even say on TV.